Good evening and salam. My name is Hadron Abashi and I'm a member of the MacFest team. I am delighted to welcome you to MacFest 2021 and our event, Egyptian Heritage and Culture. Every year, we like to celebrate the heritage and culture of one country. In the first year, we celebrated Turkey. Last year, we celebrated Palestine. This year, we are celebrating Egypt. And I'm delighted to introduce you to our host for the panel, Alaa Ali, and my former head teacher um, of Manchester Islamic High School for Girls, Mrs. Mona Mohammed. I'm going to share a few words about Alaa. Alaa Ali is from Egypt, and she graduated from the Faculty of Arts studying English literature. After graduation, she worked for two years in Egypt. After getting married and moving to Saudi Arabia with her husband, she worked as a kindergarten supervisor in international school for over seven years. In this period, she met people from many different cultures and backgrounds, which encouraged her to take the next step of her life. She, two years ago, she came to the UK to start a new life as a mother and volunteer at MacFest. She has also started learning Tajweed and Quran science. She's interested in recycling, reusing, painting, culture and arts and crafts. Before I hand over to Allah, I would like the audience to please follow MacFest on our social media uh, channels of Facebook, Instagram and Twitter so you're informed of our next event. Thank you and over to you, Allah. Thank you, Hajra, very much. I am very happy to listen to these words from you. I love you so much. Thank you so much. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Hello and salam, everybody. My name is Ala, Ala Ali. I am from Egypt. It's a great honor to me today to be a MACFES team for a second year and to, uh, to, to have this uh, great thing to do. This about Egypt, my lovely country. It seemed awful and terrified to talk about yourself. So what about talking about a whole great country like Egypt? In our program today, we have so much things because Egypt is a rich country by culture, by art, by history, even by music, uh, rich, whatever you, whatever you want to talk, whatever you want to listen. In Egypt, you will find some great thing to have. First of all, I want to give a big thank you to Kisra to give me this chance to talk about Egypt and to present some aspect of our life in Egypt. And to all MACFES teams, they support me a lot. And again, to thank you for my family, especially my husband and my two daughters. They support me and help me a lot. And please allow me to greet my family from Egypt. I think they, so, they join us. I miss them so much as uh, now this is my second year. I, uh, I am here in UK as a newcomer, but for coronavirus and the pandemic, we didn't travel for our summer vacation. I hope I see them soon. When we talk about Egypt, we can't forget that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned Egypt in his Torah and Bible and of course in Holy Quran. If we talk about Egypt in Quran, we will find the five surah. This, uh, or Allah mentioned Egypt in four surah, but five times. That we have one in Surah Al-Baqarah, second in Surah Yunus, and two times in Surah Yusuf, and then in Surah Al-Zukhruf. And all of you know that Allah took his prophet Moses in uh, a tour mountain in Sinai, which is located in Egypt. So we have two surah in Quran. It's a Surah Atin and Surah at tur by the name of the mountain. Now we will listen to a lovely daughter for me, my little princess Noor. She will tell us Surat, uh, Surat Atin. It's up to you, Noor. Hi, everyone. I'm so happy to be with you today. And now I'm going to be reading Surat Atin. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Wattini wa zaytun wa turi al-sinin Wa hadha al-balad al-amin Lakad khalaqna al-insan fi ahsani taqweem Thumma radannahu asfal al-sayfilin Illa al-lazina amanu wa amanu bil-salihat Falahum ajrun ghayra mamnoon 
فأما من كذب كذب بعد بالدين فليس الله بأحكم الحاكمين صدق الله العظيم. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you Noor so much. I hope you enjoy her, her voice and uh, may Allah forgive forgive her for his little mistakes. And now I want to start our journey to Egypt. I'll take you for uh, a trip for a trip to Egypt. So please sit relax and fasten your seat and be ready to visit Egypt. Visit fantastic places. I hope you enjoy our video. Yes, uh, please Steve share uh, the video. Uh, I want to have an excuse for you to speak some few little in Arabic because uh, it have another test in Arabic. Hello, Abeladi, beautiful my country. I love, I love it. Uh, I hope you enjoy our video. And uh, if you visit Egypt before, you can remember some places. If you didn't, so please uh, get your chance to travel to Egypt because you will enjoy a lot. Any, any city, any place you choose in Egypt to visit, you will enjoy, really. And now, I uh, inter allow me to introduce to you my lovely daughter, Mariam Suleiman. Mariam, 
is a year 10 student at Veriswood School, and she will take you in a journey again to Pharaoh's age. It's uh, over to you, Maria. Um, hello, everybody. I'm so happy to take you back to the magical ages of Pharaoh's age, uh, which is like 3,000 years before century. It's like traveling through time with the time machine. It will be all about recognizing how beautiful and strong the Egyptian queens are and to know their achievements and how wonderful their time was. So um, we're going to talk about queens of first age and how they were so powerful and strong at the time. All right, so... Um, Though ancient Egypt is known for its magnificent pyramids, enduring sphinx and mighty pharaohs, most attention is given to the female monarchs of that time, unless they were Cleopatra or Nefertiti, because none of the other queens were so much known. Yet the queens of Egypt were a powerful force in their own right, even as wives to the pharaohs. With their own enduring legacies, some of them have even ruled without a man by their side. Here's a look at some of these powerful women from the past. The first queen we have is Queen Merneth. Little is known about her, uh, with scholars unsure if she actually ruled Egypt with its first dynasty. Uh, there, is, there are only little records of her name in any tomb. Yet so, she's still believed to have a figure to, of great power at her life, and the earliest woman to rule Egypt as she was buried alongside with 50 servants. His son Dan was too young to rule Egypt, and so it's believed that Merneth ruled in his stead, like he didn't rule Egypt like she was hoping him. The next queen that we're having is Queen Sobek Nifero. She's also spelled Nifrosobek, like you could just switch like the half of the two of the word. Uh, queen Sobek Nifero rose to power after the death of, of her brother, Amin Mahat. Uh, the fourth, she was the eighth ruler of Egypt and she ruled for like nearly four years. So as you could see, like the photo loses her like um, her nose, it was broken. So though missing her nose, the queen's tattooed shows that she appeared to combine masculine and feminine aspects and is believed to have used male names and headdresses while wearing female dresses along a alongside a, um, a male. Because like most queens that just believe that because they're like female queens, like um, like people in Egypt wouldn't like respect her or walk through the rules or something. So that's why they did it. So people would just think that there could be like male pharaohs too. And the next queen is also Queen Hatshepsut. Like I think that most of you like know who is Queen Hatshepsut. She ruled for over like 21 years. Like it was the longest uh, reign of any female ruler in Egypt. So she had a lot of power and she was so strong as any, like as a single male pharaoh, not just a female one. Uh, during the seventh year of her reign, Hatshepsut uh, went even further and asked to be depicted as a man, wearing a false beard and ordering to be referred to not as a queen, but as a king. So like I told you before, it's not just like the other queen, like many queens could be referred to that because they think that people wouldn't respect her because she's a female queen. So her reign was peaceful, a time when many monuments were erected. And that was something so good, like she ruled for 21 years and there was many places made at that time. However, after her death, uh, possibly even her own stepson or um, her successor, uh, the III, attempted to erase all records of her and of that proved like that she was so strong and powerful and she was so good and beautiful because he just wanted to like, um, he didn't accept that his stepmom could do that. So Hatshepsut is still remembered to, till this day, having defied the tradition that Egypt would have no female pharaohs. Uh, Queen Nefertiti, uh, she is one of the most known queens of Egypt. She was the, one of the most also beautiful rulers, still inspiring cosmetics to this, till this day. Queen Nefertiti was as beautiful as she was mysterious because no one even knows from where that she came. And she was wife to Pharaoh Akhenaten and bore him six daughters and was a key part of his cult of Aten, which, which worships the sun as a divine being and shunned all other gods. 
Nefertiti was hailed for her beauty, with some scholars believing she may have been revered as a fertility goddess. And the next queen is uh, Queen Cleopatra. I think that maybe all of you also heard about her. So, like so much already has been written about Cleopatra, one of the most famous Egyptian figures in, and indeed one of the most historical persons of all time. Countless books, painting, and plays, including one by Shakespeare and movies have been made depicting her life as ruler and her tragic love affair with Roman politician uh, Mark Antony. She was born in like 69 years before century. Cleopatra VII, Theophil Philopater, was bred to be a ruler having come from a long line of reality. Uh, outlasting her two older sisters to succeed her father as ruler of Egypt's Ptolemaic Empire, Cleopatra's reign was marked by intrigue and tragedy, ultimately culminating in her iconic suicide at just 39 years old. So she um, ended her life by herself, like when she was 38 years. And um, thank you all for listening to me. I hope you've enjoyed your time with me and knowing about the queens in Egypt and how they were so powerful and strong. Yes, thank you, Maria. Mm -hmm. Am I supposed to speak? <laughs> yeah, just one minute. <laughs> Thank you, Maria. I enjoy talking about fears about queens, about women. They really give us a powerful and strength and the positive energy in everything. They are they really great. And now we, we reach to the bar to, we all love, we all waiting for, we all love music, songs, especially if, uh, when it comes from Egypt. Today, allow me to introduce a famous uh, um, melodist, maestro, singer. Uh, he worked with a lot of famous singers in Egypt. And uh, also he shared a mini Egyptian national celebration. And, uh, and he, he lived here for a long time. He lectured in uh, Salford University. I'm so proud to meet him for uh, the first time. I'm so proud of him as an Egyptian singer, live in Manchester. And uh, I can't find any word to give him his right as uh, a musician. Allow me to welcome Mr. Ahmad Rashidi. Mr. Ahmad okay. is uh, joining us, and it's over to you to start uh, enjoying us for your music. Thank you very much, Allah. Thank you. Welcome. I know how to start um, how to start playing or start talking. So uh, let me play. Uh, this oud is um, an Egyptian instrument. Uh, actually, it started from uh, an instrument called the tambour, which is uh, a small face and long neck. Uh, and then it came uh, to this shape, uh, finally, uh, and the strings started to increase because the other one used to have one or two strings. Uh, it looks like, a bit like uh, Uzuki. So this is, there is an Egyptian one, and there is a Turkish one, and there is an Iraqi one. Uh, so I tried, uh, I tried the Egyptian one, of course, uh, and uh, and this one is the Iraqi one, uh, which uh, you can see has got uh, the strings going over over a bridge. It starts from here, the string, and go over a bridge, and then it reach reach this this part is called the amp, and these are, of course, the keys for tuning. Uh, the Egyptian, uh, this is not very Egyptian old. Uh, the Egyptian one I, I learned with, it looks like, like this. Uh, generally it looks similar, but the string starts from here. The string starts from here, not from here, like the, the, like the other one. Uh, and of course the neck is a bit slimmer than this one. So in the last period, last uh, few months, I've been playing with this. So I play with it. Uh, and of course, uh, well, this is Ebony. 
and this is sometimes the very harmful or epic. This part, this this neck, uh, and of course it's, uh, this is the sound box, and you control uh, it just like the guitar. You control uh, the tunes by uh, playing with the length of the string. It's changed when you shorten uh, the string. Okay, let me play something now because there's something else I want to tell you. So that was improvising on Taoud. This is how it sounds. There's something more important I want to tell about the Egyptian, about Egypt and the music. That uh, Dori Mi Fa Sol La Si is Egyptian, is not Greek, is not Pythagoras. Because there was, uh, uh, my source is the book of uh, the description of Egypt. It was composed, it was written by the French when they invaded Egypt. Uh, so, uh, Daoud, uh, 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 it was they found a bronze of seven planets. I'll just shorten the talk. It was seven planets. Uh, so they put uh, the seven days of the week and the seven tunes of uh, music uh, and the colors. They put them all together aligned. Uh, so uh, what happened? is uh, even the, the, the days of the week are called uh, the names of planets, like Saturday is Saturn, a Sunday is Sun, Monday is Moon. And in some other uh, European uh, languages, uh, they find Mercury D and, and anyway, uh, another names for planets. And they did Do, Re, Mi, Fa, Sol, La, Si, but the only difference was Do was called Ut, U-T, Ut, Re, Mi, Fa, Sol, La, Si. So, Dolimi Fasola Si, the base of the music is Egyptian and not any other, <laughs> didn't come from anywhere, didn't come from anywhere else. Uh, so, uh, later on, I, I, I'm going to sing some, uh, some Egyptian song, songs. So, uh, so I, uh, I now give the talk to uh, the item after me. Thank you very much. Hello. Hello. Ada, over to you. Yes, I'm here. I can talk for hours, by the way, but I'm, I'm just trying to shorten. I'm trying to shorten what I'm talking about. Okay, we can listen to some music again. I love it. Thank you. Yes, welcome. Okay. Uh, 
Uh, okay, let me improvise again because uh, after that I'm going to sing. So I'm, uh, I'll play the singing. I'll improvise again. But okay? now, just some music. Just some music, if you if you love. <laughs> amazing music thank you, uh, very much. thank you very much thank you very much it's really wonderful thank you 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 make us back to egypt and to fantastic music <laughs> thank you very much again and now let me ask you a question have you ever visit egypt in spring or uh, see how egyptian people Celebration. celebration, make a celebration for spring, how they spend uh, what we call Sham al Nasim. Mr. Ahmad, how many years you spend, uh, you, you stay here and didn't visit Egypt in spring? Yeah, maybe. Uh, is, that, is that, are you talking to me or are you actually speaking? Yes, about I'm asking you, I'm asking you, yeah, how oh, many yes, years yes, you are yes, here? Yes. I didn't. I love Egypt. I visited. I, I've been to Egypt, you know, most times. I, I've got a job in Egypt, by the way. I'm, I'm, I'm teaching at the Opera House, so, and I love going, going, going coming back and, and, and see to see the people and to walk in the streets and uh, and uh, to go and um, and eat the traditional foods and uh, yeah, of course. Oh, Egypt. very nice. So today, so today we let you back to Egypt in the spring, and uh, what. Watch with us this video with the voice of Mrs. Mona Muhammad. I want to thank her for her uh, joining uh, and preparing this uh, video about the uh, spring. Yes, uh, it's you, Steve, to share the video for Sham al Nasim. Sham al Nasim is an Egyptian national holiday marking the beginning of spring. It is a pharaonic festival which goes back to ancient Egyptian times and is one of the Egypt's oldest celebrations. El Nasim translates to smelling the breeze in Arabic and commemorates the arrival of spring, ushering in the agriculture season. The event is thought to have ancient origins with, with celebrations dating back thousands of years. 
predating our religion. Evidence places the first celebration of Shem and Nisim between 2650 to 2575 BC. Back then it was known as Shimu, as spring festivals, whereby citizens offer salted fish and other food. It is likely the event was held to correspond with the spring, an occurrence which was once determined by the direction of the sun against the pyramids of Giza. As the country became more Arab, the name was phonocemantically matched to Shem and Nisim, and celebrations began to resemble those we see today. A typically cheerful and friendly occasion, Shem and Nisim sees people all over religion, heads, heads to parks and gardens to celebrate spring. Weather in Egypt at this time of year tends to be pleasant, with mild temperatures enjoyed by all. Picnics at the pastime are the pastime of choice. Families gather together and feast on traditional food while children enjoy games like football. Other popular activities include Nile cruising, beach visits, and trips to the zoo. Shem and Nassim is a wonderful day to be in Egypt, but prospective visitors should anticipate large crowds and plan their trip in advance, not during the pandemic, of course. This year, Shem and Nassim will fall on Monday the 3rd of May, which obviously this is the month of Ramadan where all Muslims will be fasting. So we don't expect Shem and Nassim to be celebrated the same way this year. It will be very, very hard during the fast for Muslims to do what they do every year and enjoy Shem and Nassim. Like many spring festivals across the world, X, ancient symbol of rebirth, are an important part of Shem and Nassim. Traditionally, Egyptians would boil and decorate them for the occasion before they were painted and hung outside their houses. There are several dishes associated with Shem and Nassim, from spring onions to lupini beans, but the most time-honoured is fisikh, aged and heavily salted marine fish. Fisikh remains an important part of Shem and Nassim. Celebrations for many, many people. It believed that fasting on fisikh is one of the longest standing traditions eaten thousands of years ago by, e by ancient Egyptian during Shimu. If you are determined to do as the Egyptian do and sample the fish, make sure you buy it from a well-known specialist who can prepare it well and keep lots of water on hand to aid in digestion. With any luck, your biggest concern is likely to be whether you can bear the smell of the fish and your stomach can also be able to digest it. Wherever you are, if you are, if you are lucky to be one year in Egypt during Shem and Nassim, trust me, you will have the most joyful time of your life. Thank you, Mrs. Mona, for that. Uh, we, we love to back to Egypt and spring Shem and Nassim. <laughs> yes, uh, as we live here for from uh, maybe one year and eight months right now, we miss Egypt. We miss here, it's spring and winter and summer every time we miss Egypt. Now back to you, Mr. Ahmed, to enjoy your voice with uh, a fantastic music and song for Said Darwish. Please, it's over yeah. to you. Let's say something about Said Darwish anyway. Uh, Said Darwish is uh, the most living composer over the history uh, of Egypt. And he is the, uh, before Said Darwish, uh, no one really sang for Egypt. Okay, people love Egypt, of course, but no one did songs for Egypt. Uh, Said Darwish was an Egypt lover, and he sang a lot, a lot of songs for Egypt. Uh, so the, the one I'm, uh, I'm about to uh, to sing now is uh, there's three forms in this age of music. There is something called tatua. There is something called masha. There is something called dor. So what I'm about to sing is tatua, which is melody A and melody B and then you repeat melody A 
and melody. This is a simple form of the song, and this that was uh, the best sandwich ever done. This is what made him famous. Uh, because he sang for everybody, he sang for everything, uh, and uh, this one is Helwadi. It's it's about the the lady farmer in uh, in the morning, and it and it's about the, I mean which is uh, uh, is married to someone or her brother is someone who is uh, a labor anyway. So it, that was you know it, it's a complete picture of the morning. One uh, of the Egyptian morning at the farm. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> nice song. Thank you. Thank yes, you so much. For everybody sang for the, the beautiful lady, <laughs> you know, doing her own bread. He sang for the, the, the worker who is going to uh, to do what he has to do. Um, he sang for everybody. Anyway. Yes, you're welcome. I'm so proud to participate in the celebration of Women International Day with a video about women's handicraft in Egypt. These crafts are really ha handmade by two Egyptian ladies who work as lecturers in the university in Egypt. Their work does reflect our popular culture, culture and heritage. So please, Steve, share this presentation or video to have again another look for these beautiful pieces. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you, Steve. Thank you so much. And now back to you, Mr. Ahmed. Yeah, by the uh, by the way, you know, for uh, for the Women's Day, said the wish thing for Egyptian ladies. Yes. And it is atatua as well. It's uh, melody A and melody B, and it beats. Uh, so this form is uh, simple, and uh, uh, the reason is. Put the lyrics in the front so you can enjoy the lyrics as well. So it gives you a simple melody so you can enjoy the lyrics as well. So this song is uh, for Bente Mas, for the, the Egyptian lady, the daughter of Egypt, the kid of Egypt. <laughs> Yeah, I got the feeling that we're 
celebration we have uh, Bent Masr. We all love to read to read the story. Tonight we bring incredible story from Sohaj city. Sohaj city located on the river Nile in Egypt where our lady was born and raised up. She came to UK for from nearly 30 years ago in a long journey starting from a young lady came with her husband ending with a position of head teacher of Islamic grammar school for, for girls and boys, executive head KD grammar school for boys and the Muslim preparatory school. But first, let us listen to this short song. This is Steve, this is named Sohaj song. This is a part of a large song, but we cut this part especially for Sohaj. This is Steve. I um, I enjoy this short song for Sohaj. I never visit Sohaj, but uh, I promise I'll try to visit Sohaj when I back to Egypt. Now allow me to welcome Mrs. Mona Muhammad or Auntie Mona, as I call as I call her always. Please, Auntie Mona, it's over to you. Thank you, Allah. Jazakallah khair. Thank you, Allah, very much. Assalamu alaikum. Good evening, everyone. Oh gosh, I'm quite overwhelmed and um, very emotionally high, and I'm I'm struggling after after going through all this journey in Egypt to, to say anything. Um, I feel a bit homesick at the moment. But anyway, I would like to sincerely thank my first namely Kisra and Allah, who I'm really really admiring you, Allah. Less than two years in this country, and you're able to be, mashallah, very confident to come and present such a national program, something that people who has been here for many years will struggle to do. But honestly, well done, well done. I am so pleased to be given this opportunity to participate in such a wealthy festival of Muslim art and culture. I am delighted to be able to share with you some aspect of my journey from Egypt to date. Um, I don't need to go to talk about where I am from. As Alaa said, I am from a very small city on the River Nile called Suhaj. And um, I actually, I lived, um, I was born and raised in Suhaj. Um, and my, my, my whole education from primary to university has been in Suhaj. Um, and I was graduated from obviously uh, the University of Science as a physics and a chemistry teacher. I was raised in a practicing and tradition family and being the only daughter in the family and eldest child as well, actually my parents were very protective. Despite this, they had high expectations of me and mashallah, they provided me with the most love, care and support that any child would wish for, for. As soon as I graduated, I got married, then was blessed with two children I worked as a physics and a chemistry teacher in a secondary school for seven years before my arrival to UK. In 1994, my husband was offered the opportunity to study his PhD and, and obviously and to come to UK. He came in September. 
I joined him with my two young children who were three and four at that time in December. I had a mixed feeling of excitement and fear. Excitement of having the opportunity to travel abroad. A, rule, a, a dream that many Egyptian girls would have to explore the totally different way of life. What I, what, what I only knew of through books, documentaries, and movies. What about fears? Why, why, what, was my, what were my fears really? My main fear was the language barrier. Being able to accommodate, being, sorry, being able to communicate with people on a day-to-day -day basis. Yes, I have studied English in university. I was able to read English, but wow, there's a massive difference between reading English and speaking English, especially with dialect as well. That's another thing. Now, I have, we came to UK and we came to the southern of UK in a very small city in the southern. And walking my children to school every day, I didn't know anyone, was a good opportunity to meet and greet mothers of the children of my children's peers. A few were very helpful and encouraging while others would just stare at you. Who is that stranger? Different color, different dress code, didn't ask any question, they just kept silent. Gradually, I was able to pick the language with great help from my children. You know, young children, they adapt so quickly and they so quickly have picked the language. After a few months, when my confidence grew a little, I volunteer in my daughter's nursery to, I said, I offered them, I said, look, I make fantastic Egyptian cookies. Wow, they were obviously quite excited. I bought my ingredients and I used to go and do small sessions with young little nursery children, show them how to make Egyptian cookies and they absolutely loved it. Then I got a little bit warmer with the teachers. They found out my background. I actually, I'm a teacher, although I don't have obviously the language she used to teach. They allowed me kindly to support, the one to one support that parents come and help children. And I used to do basic maths with some of the children, which again, I owe those young children a massive, massive thank you because they helped me to expand my vocabulary. I managed to make a circle of few friends who I'm still in touch with to date. They helped me to get a part-time job. They said, listen, Mona, don't take any courses in English. You will take your age to learn the language. To learn the language. We will get you a job that doesn't need a qualifications, but it will, uh, it will allow you to communicate with people and pick the language. And I said, right, what job, what would I do? They said, right, you will come and join us. Pick apples from farms. So I went to farms, I picked apples, picked strawberries, I picked raspberries. Helped me to make new friends, to be able to communicate. I absolutely thoroughly enjoyed it. Something I would never in a million year would be able to do this in Egypt. It's not part of the culture and I wouldn't be able to do it. I absolutely thoroughly enjoyed it. My second fear was the culture shock, the weather, the food. I had too many questions in my head. Will people be friendly and helpful? Different social life to the way I've been brought up. Would people accept me? Will I be able to blend in and fit in? These are too many questions for me. Moving to UK to a cultural environment, which totally different from my own, was a great challenge for me and my family. At the beginning, when, we, when you arrived at Heathrow, came to England, the excitement part took over everything. Everything looked fantastic, beautiful, new people, new food, the unforgettable attraction and things to do. It was all just so wonderful. Nothing really mattered at the time. I arrived in December and December is Christmas. I just came before Christmas time. Christmas, you only something I've seen in TV. In reality, I was amazed by the lights, by the, the decoration, by everything. It was just, a, it was beautiful, like a different world. And we were very excited, me and the children, just to see these lights everywhere and different, very, very different. Unfortunately, this feeling, had not lasted with me for a long time before the next stage started. Arriving from a hot country, let me tell you, Egypt, actually, Suhag, where I came from, is the fourth warm, hottest place in, in Egypt. 
and it's the 296th place, hot place globally. So you can imagine what, what, where I came from, what was the weather like. Arriving in 1984 in December, and I believe I was told at the time that it was one of the worst. You haven't had snow like this for many years. That's, that was my luck. It was terrible. I, to me, it was terrible. I only seen snow on TV, never ever seen it physically, be able to touch it. It was beautiful to look at the white and the snow, but actually to go out and walk, in, it was honestly, we cried, me and my kids, so much because it was very hard. The freezing was unbearable. Later on, my kids obviously loved, loved snow, loved throwing snowballs and making snowmen in the back garden. Once the new culture started actually to hit me, I started to be get a bit confused and at times irritated because it was different than what I expected. Couldn't find answers to many aspects of people behavior. For example, days passed, days, and I haven't seen any, don't see any of my neighbors. These people don't come out. You go to Egypt, that you, honestly, people everywhere, so many. You have a new neighbor in Egypt, and I'm talking about Egyptian neighbor, not even a foreigner. And that's a, a become an obligatory duty for everyone to knock on the door. Do you need help? Do, do you want us to try to something with you? Food, don't cook. At least maybe the first week people would be sending food for them because you don't want them to bother. Let them get in and sat in. I haven't seen anyone knocking on my door or looking at me or offering anything. My husband was very engaged with obviously his study in the university and then he didn't really have that time to stay with us at home to settle us so we had really to do it on our own kind of and i remember my first visit to my neighbor who happens that her son was in my son's primary school and i went to ask her something knocked on the door and asked her and she said to me oh come in mona come in and i walked i went in sat down then she asked me would you like a cup of tea or coffee and actually the question hit me, what do you mean by would you like at net? You never in Egypt, that's again culture, you never ask a guest, would you like, because that would be considered very inhos inhospitality and very rude. What do you mean? And do you really expect the guest to say yes? No, you don't. So out of politeness, I said, no, thank you. Then she followed to say, are you sure? And that's another, what do you mean by are you sure? I couldn't, I could no way ask her to make me a drink. I said, no, thank you. What did she do? She went and she made a drink for herself and she sat down to drink with me. Oh gosh, honestly, I sat down there and I said, what type of people are these? Do they not? And I was all sorts of things, honestly, that you can imagine I was thinking about, why did I come to this country? What am I doing here? How can these people have no even inch of hospitality? What the funny thing that I'll tell you now, a few years later when I, I was in Manchester, and my mother was here for a visit, a few years. I had an English friend, very close friends, came to visit me. What did I do? I said to my friend, oh, would you like a cup of tea or coffee? Oh, she said, no, Mona, thank you, thank you very much. So I, I followed, are you sure? She said, oh, no, 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 so I sat down. My mom went in the kitchen and she gave me a shot. Mona, I went in the kitchen. She gave me a lecture. Rude, how does this the way I brought you up? You ask your guests, would you like a cup of tea? Is this the way? Oh my God, all this terbiya after all this bringing up is gone. How can you behave like this? I tried my best to explain to my mom. You know, my mom, I think the way we're doing it is not the right way. We force guests to eat and drink. We put things in front of them and we expect them out of politeness to eat it and to drink it even if they don't want to. And you know, mom, honestly, if my friend wanted a drink, she will say yes, please. And if I offered her food and she wanted it, she will have it. And I absolutely, this suited me. I absolutely loved it. That, that's, I absolutely loved it. But try to convince my mom, forget about it. Being a, able to find the type of food that I used to get, it was another challenge. Obviously being in the south of, in a small city in the south of UK, there were very limited, very limited type of vegetables and fruit and things that I, ingredients that I use to use at home to cook. I couldn't find it. But, however, this did not stop me from making the most out of these limited resources. And I managed to make a variety of Egyptian dishes and shared it with my neighbors, knocking neighbors and neighbors' door and offer a plate of biscuit. 
or a sweet or a savory. People found it very strange to start with, but believe me, they absolutely loved it. And I wanted to pass some of my heritage, some of my culture to other people. I'm learning the culture here and I wanted them to see that. And to be honest, they absolutely opened their arm, very welcome. They absolutely enjoyed it and loved it. Um, one of the things that I really wanted to learn when I came here, and please don't laugh, it was an apple pie. What is an apple pie? I've seen it in the TV, in the film, apple pie, apple pie, even my friends when I was coming. Mona, don't forget to find out what is the apple pie. And look at this, I worked in a farm, in an apple picking farm, so I was coming with bags of apples every day. And I've learned how to make apple pies, and it was absolutely fantastic. I love it. After some time, I was able to adapt much English culture. And in fact, a lot of it suited me and I loved it. I didn't realize how English I became in a very positive way, by the way, until I visited Egypt after 16 years was my first visit to Egypt. And I had another culture shock in my own country. I was really shocked to find out, oh my God, what are people are doing? My children found extremely shocking culture, in particular when it came to food. And they go from one house to other house, 16 years away from the country, everyone wanted to invite you and everyone wanted you to eat the whole table of food in front of you. And it's very difficult to say no, it is impolite. And my father used to stare at my children and be like, I can't eat it, I'm really... And my father used to say, eat. And he used to give me a lecture after, teach your children how to behave. And people, said, this is not the behavior, the kids are going to be sick. But it, it was very challenging, but was very beautiful. And my kids loved actually visiting Egypt. I managed, alhamdulillah, to overcome the differences and found a sense of belonging in my new environment. I learned to accept the differences in culture and was quite comfortable with the new place and feeling. However, I was really missing to meet people from the same faith, my own faith. Um, I was the only Muslim in this very small city. I couldn't meet anyone. Um, my, as I said to you before, my headscarf seemed very, very strange to many people. And one of the first thing and the most thing I missed is hearing the Adhan, which is the call for prayers, which you hear in Egypt five times a day. And after one and a half year in the, in the South, my husband had to move to Manchester, to university in Manchester again. I knew, I have never really settled. I've already made some friends. And it, it was again, another fear, no excitement this time, believe me. It was more fear than why do I have to start again? We moved to Manchester, but wow, Manchester obviously is in the North. And I realized there again, another, another difference in culture and another difference in, 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 in many things, actually many things, a very, and a much warmer and friendly place. Many Muslims, mosques, places of worships, hijab with a, with a very, very common or the Islamic dress is worn. Endless variety of halal meat and shops and restaurants, fruit and vegetable, literally. I was open, I was, open. I was really able in Manchester to practice my own faith freely and with joy with a wider range of people from different culture and background. Soon I became a Manicunian and a very proud one. And honestly, I absolutely love Manchester. In 1988, I was blessed with a third child, alhamdulillah. I got a part-time job as a teacher of RS in one of the supplementary schools in Manchester where I really enjoyed and it made me realize that actually teaching is my passion. In 1991, this is where Manchester Islamic High School for Girls was established and I was appointed as a part-time teacher of Arabic and religious studies. At this point, again, I decided that's it. I have to become, I really need to gain my qualification to become an English a qualified teacher. I need to do my postgraduate certificate of education. I've got to do it. Alhamdulillah, I managed to complete it successfully in 1994. And this was a big turning point of my proficient career. Since then, my career developed like, honestly, like a roller coaster. I became a head of department, I became a deputy head, an acting head, a head teacher. And recently, until obviously after so many years, I'm currently the, ex as Alat said, I'm the executive head teacher of a very, very successful schools, Muslim schools in Manchester. Love it and enjoy it thoroughly. 
Manchester Islamic Grammar School for Girls and KD Grammar School for Boys and Manchester Muslim Preparatory School. I have been an independent and mainstream faith inspector and I'm also the vice chair of the Association of Muslim School. I'm very, very passionate about serving the community and making difference in many people's lives, which is my utmost goal. I believe I managed to firmly achieve what, I, what I've never ever thought that I could achieve. This has helped me to connect with people, enrich my life and to grow as a person. I strongly believe that the key for success I could summarize from my experience, I could summarize it in a few points. My first one, first one is determination, where determination, firmness and purposes and willingness to work towards this purpose, regardless of any obstacles. And I had so many obstacles that could kill my determination and it didn't kill it, actually it didn't. Ambitious goals required high tolerance for paying a large amount of patient, never give up, never give up, no matter what, as it takes long time to achieve anything that is great. Goes hand in hand skills. Obviously you can be determined, but if you don't have the required skills to develop yourself for the goals you set for yourself, it's no point, no matter how determined you are. And that's, for example, my determination to be a teacher it wouldn't be any good if I did not go to gain my qualifications to become a teacher. Then when I wanted, when I became a head teacher, I had to do my qualification to become a British qualified head teacher or to, to become to go to Ofsted and I mean, I took, took the Ofsted training to become an inspector. These are all needs, skills. You can't just do them because you determine. Then what about passion? No one, even if, no matter how determined and skillful you are, if, you don't, if you're not passionate, you can't gain and bear in the thousands and thousands of hours you have to spend to achieve and to gain what you want to gain. If you love what you do, you never have to work. So passion is the driving wheel for everything that you do. Then again, hand in hand, you need to be, have some discipline, discipline to yourself. You can be passionate about you doing, but you're still going. And there will be some times when you simply don't feel that you can go anymore. I'm not in the mood. I give up. I'm going to stop. I can't go anymore. It's not going to work. You can't let that stop you. You must be able to discipline yourself and get motivated to continue whatever you feel like, whether you like it or not. Remember that today's struggle is tomorrow's strength. And last but never ever the least is the will of Allah the Almighty. So you can have a belief, I strongly believe that you can be the most determined person, skilled, passionate, and disciplined in the whole world. But you can only succeed in achieving your goal. If Allah the Almighty wanted it to be, it will be, he granted you. Indeed, I trust that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is something meant to be good for me, it would be good for me. If it didn't happen, I trust that it was not meant for me and it was not good, good for me. And I'm grateful for whatever he prescribed upon me. I'm so grateful first and foremost to the Allah the Almighty for bestowing his blessing on me to be where I am now. To my family, and I have to say, especially my husband, for his great support and believing in me and all the fascinating people and friends that I met throughout my journey in supporting me to be the person I am today. And my advice to those who arrive and settle in UK, do not isolate yourselves and form their own community. There's nothing wrong with forming their own community, but don't isolate yourself. Then without realizing you will find yourself in a situation of them and us. Do not miss this great opportunity to learn about other people, culture and background. Celebrate the similarities and respect the differences, whether you agree with it or not. At the end, we are all humans. Alhamdulillah, I am very proud to be a Muslim, a British and a woman. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. much to you. Thank you too much. <laughs> I really enjoy it and learn a lot from you as a newcomer to UK.
and you reach my program. Thank you very thank much. You. No, thank you very much. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Absolutely a pleasure. Thank really honored to have you as a chief guest. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. I am the honored one. Thank you, Allah. Honestly, thank you. Yes, thank you. I hope we meet again and again and more events. Inshallah. I'm sure we will. Inshallah. And now uh, we will take you back to Egypt to have a look on some delicious food. And remember our mahshi, kushari, bashamel, and taba of vehicles. And we have uh, so many delicious dishes famous in Egypt. Even our street food, even our fast food, even our sofra, it will be very great in all the time of the year. Now again with Maryam, and she will uh, introduce to us a tasty presentation. It's up to you, Maryam. Super thank you. Thank you. Um, first, I want to say like, welcome all of you back with me again. And we're going to talk about like Egyptian cousin foods and stuff. So we all know that uh, when we talk when when we talk about Egypt or when we think of Egypt, we think of the pyramids, sphinx, pharaohs, hieroglyphics, mummies, and ancient and ancient temples. But we don't we never think about Egyptian food and um, because it's not like so well known for everybody. However, we're here to enlighten you about the delicious foods that we are readily available in Egypt and are extremely tasty to say the least. Like other countries, food is a large part of Egyptian culture, where you can find different varieties of the same food uh, all over Egypt, like north to south, with each region adding its own unique flavor or twist to receive. Sounds tantalsingly tasty, right? So our first like uh, street food would be taimi and full mdamis. So taimi and full mdamis, which are essentially fava beans and flafil, are the original Egyptian fast foods. They're a staple of the Egyptian diet, mainly because they're filling uh, and use ingredients that are easily accessible in the country. The food is made of fava beans that are cooked for hours in a pot. But the taimiya, which is an Egyptian falafel, is made from crushed fava beans that is later made into a paste, then fried. Nowadays, you can find falafels all over the Middle East. However, Egypt is the actual origin of those delightful fried treats. It's a perfect dish for every single uh, vegetarian person. Now we go next to shakshuka and at soup, which is also called lentil soup. They're also like vegetarian food for vegetarian people. So shakshuka is a dish of eggs poached in a sauce of tomato and olive oils, pepper, onion and garlic. And commonly spiced with some, so, with some cumin, uh, paprika, cayenne pepper and nutmeg. Egg shakshuka evolved from an Ottoman meat stew. It's also called shakshuka. It depends if you want it with egg or not. And maybe it could be, you could add to it some meat. And add soup, which is based on lentils. It may be vegetarian or include meat too. It may use br brown, red, yellow, or black lentils with or without the husk. The whole yellow and red lentils disintegrate in cooking, making a thick soup. And now we have um, hamam mahshi and roasted duck. They're like one of my most uh, favorite food and like um, dishes in Egypt. I really love eating both of them. So the roasted duck, first we, firstly we boil the duck, then we go on adding onion, bay leaves, salt and pepper. And then we just wait until it get cooked. And then we go on frying it in a frying pan. But like maybe like, um, the size of the duck is so big, so you could just cut it into pieces and, and put it to fry. But trust me, it tastes so nice, you need to try it. In the hamam mahshi, which is a pigeon, it's stuffed with rice or green weight, like um, whatever you want to stuff it with. So the green weight, we call an Egypt freak, and then you could, also, uh, you could also add some herbs. So firstly, we boil it also until it's fully cooked, and then you could... Um, Fill it with rice or with the grain weight, like uh, as, as what you like. And then we roast it or grill it. It's also depending on what you like. And then we go on to the mulkhiya and sa'a. So the mulkhiya is um, um, the leaves, and they're finely chopped and we could add, like we put them with a booth from like chicken or meat or like 
what what kind of broth you like. You add to it a garlic or cranda or like any uh, a taste of like um, like thyme vegetables or stuff. And then um, you, some people like uh, like eating it with um, broth from rabbits or shrimps, and that is so popular in Alexandria too. And you could add it from like a um, broth a fish, and that's so also popular in Port Said. It's often considered the country's national dish because it's so tasty. You could eat it with rice. You could eat it with uh, some bread. You could just eat it with a spoon. It's so nice. And then we have them sa'a, or like you could call it misaka, a sliced eggplant slightly grilled and placed in a flat pan with sliced onion, green peppers, chili, and also chili peppers if you'd like to. The dish is then covered with a red sauce made of uh, tomato paste and spices then baked into the oven. And it will look so delicious as you could see in the photo. And then you have Futir Mushaltit. Uh, Futir is a flaky Egyptian layered pastry. It consists of many thin layers of dough and ghee. And, and, and you have the optional filling if you want it to be just like plain or you want to fill it with stuff. And the filling can be both sweet or sour. So the sweet filling may be like cheese or um, honey or like chocolate if you want to also. But maybe you could also make it sour, which could be like a beef or sausage or maybe like um, salted cheese. But plain cheese is usually soaked in honey and spread with jam or cheese, or maybe served with olives too. Because of its versatility, tear is often referred to as an Egyptian pizza. You can see in the photos that they're so delicious and like they're also one of my favorite food in Egypt. Like I really like to eat it when I go there. And then you have the most famous dish in Egypt, which is kushari. Kushari is an Egyptian dish originally made in the 19th century. It's made with rice, macaroni, lentils, and they're all mixed together, topped with spiced tomato sauce and garlic vinegar. So we could also add to it some um, like different shapes of macaroni or whatever you like. And they all could be added to chickpeas and crispy fried onions if you'd like to too. A sprinkling of garlic juice or garlic vinegar and hot sauce are optional, but most people in Egypt like it with a uh, hot sauce because it just feels so tasty with it. It is a popular street food in Egypt, like whenever you could go in Egypt, you'll find it like in, in every single street in Egypt. And it's really so delicious. Um, next we have is macaroni bechamel. It's an Egyptian variant of the Italian lasagna without the cheese. Typically consists of penny slathered in bechamel sauce with a layer of slowly fried ground beef, onions, and tomato paste topped with some more penny and bechamel sauce, topped again with a thin layer of bechamel sauce and brushed with an egg wash. Like, uh, as you can see here, like there's just uh, some penny macaroni and then you have the beef or the meat that you like. And then again, some um, penny macaroni with the bechamel sauce. So it's like really so nice and beautiful and so tasty. I really like eating it, it's so nice. Some people like, it could be also like a vegan food cause you know, it, it's optional to add the meat. Like if you want to add the meat, that's good. Like the beef one, or if you don't want to then you just could eat like the macaroni with the bachelor sauce. So you, after you add like the bachelor sauce you just like get it into the oven to get it uh, baked to perfection. Some prepare it as a variant of the Greek pastizzo, inco incorporating gibna rumi. It's an Egyptian cheese similar to sardo or cranio cheese, along with a mixture of penny macaroni and bechamel sauce, and usually two layers of cooked spiced meat with onions. But as I said before, it's just optional if you want to add the meat, because at first I didn't like eating it with the meat, and then I found that with the beef ones or like the meat, it was so beautiful, so I just added it. So you could just eat it without it. And then you have another dish called Ruzumamar. It's a rice dish made by adding milk or bao cream, like which one you prefer, to the rice. So uh, you could also add a chicken stock or broth to cook dries, then baking it in an oven. It is frequently substituted for plain white rice at festive occasions and large family meals. It is normally served in a special casserole made out of clay. It's called bram. So, as you can see, like in this photo, like the down one, that uh, that uh, casserole made up 
place called Bram. So nice. I really liked it, but it's hard to find it here in like UK or Manchester. And we have also like the last dish is mahshi. I guess that maybe most of you know it. It's a famous uh, like dish in Egypt in the Middle East too. But like each country make it in a different way. So in Egypt, like um, we boil, like we like it to be like hot and cooked. But maybe in other Middle Eastern country, they just like eating it cold and not cooked. So it's a stuffed of rice seasoned with crushed red tomatoes, onion, parsley, dill, salt, pepper, and spices too. Put into vegetables like green pepper, uh, eggplants, tomatoes, maybe grape leaves, and like whatever type you would like it to be with. They are then placed in a pot and topped with chicken broth or beef broth, so it so it then could get cooked so you could eat it. That's how we do it in Egypt. But other countries they don't cook it, they eat it and they add to it like a sauce or something. So thank you all for listening. I hope you've enjoyed your time with me and with us here. Yes, thank you, Mariam, so much. I really enjoy Ramadan, enjoy our food, enjoy everything in Egypt. And now uh, we reach to Ramadan. You all of you know uh, Ramadan. Uh, maybe a few weeks, maybe two or three weeks only to reach to Ramadan. And uh, it's a very special time in, in Egypt. Here we have a, a few lines. Uh, little Princess Noor will read it. Let's listen to her and then we enjoy a beautiful song from Mr. Ahmed about Ramadan. We have Noor, she will read this. Hi everyone again. Now that I'm free about Ramadan in Egypt, Ramadan in Egypt has, has a special space full of special atmosphere. We decorate the streets with colorful decoration. Make free iftar. You should offer your best food for the people on the streets which is named Moed Rahman. Mosques, mosques open its doors all the day. Families gather and sharing food and, and, sp and spending time together. So many memories I have with my family. Now go and show, show my Ramadan Fanus. Yes, really we have a small collection for Fanus Ramadan. This is a traditional in Egypt. Uh, each Ramadan, we buy a new fanus for our children and we decorated our balcony with a bigger one, of course, maybe uh, one meter as height. And we have small medallions. Yes. Yes, and we start to sing a song, uh, Ramadan Gana, with uh, Mr. Ahmed. It's over to you, Mr. Ahmed.
Thank you, thank you, Mr. Ahmed. You really reached my program today. Thank you very much. Um, our time is finished and we have to go. It's uh, it's best very soon. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining me. And I hope you all enjoy our program in Egypt. I hope you all visit Egypt and enjoy our time in, in it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kisra, for this uh, chance for me. And I hope you all enjoy it. Thank you so much. What can I say, Allah? That was absolutely amazing. I'm lost for words what you managed to pack in in one and a half hour from artifacts, from food to music, from, I don't know, your country, your songs, uh, geography, history, it's all there. It's been a terrific feast. And thank you so much, not just to you, your lovely, gorgeous daughters. It's like a family affair. This is our family doing it. You're two gorgeous girls, so confident, full of poise. And they really helped you a lot. And of course, Sister Mona, she's got lots of fans here. <laughs> They've been praising her all the time, like these girls. And well done for that lovely sharing of your journey. It's a true compelling story. I loved the way you delivered it. And thank you so much, Brother Imad. You have entertained us really well throughout and given us a feeling of what the music's like in Egypt. And I'm sure for Allah and Sister Mona and all the other Egyptians, they've Very been well. transported back to Egypt. And I'm particularly proud of this event. You know why everybody who's listening to me? This is our in-house MacFest event. Allah is one of our volunteers. She joined us two years ago. And here today, she's delivering, as Sister Mona said, a national event and with such confidence, with such research and background, and she delivered it beautifully. And as Sister Mona reminded us, imagine this is a fourth language. So imagine me doing that in it Italian. Could I do it? I doubt it. So if you were all here, I'm sure you would do a big clap for them. So I'm really proud of you guys. Thank you so much. And of, and of course, my own team at the back who've been helping us, Hadra, who introduced the event and who happened to be the former student of uh, Sister Mona. So it was quite a family affair here. And then Steve, wonderful Steve who hosts this and then the rest of the team. And of course, finally, you people, our attendees who joined us from everywhere, thank you for giving us your Saturday evening. We really appreciate that. It's a time normally when you sit down and have your meal, but you've been here with us. I hope you haven't made you too hungry. I'm ready for my meal. I don't know about you, but just a quick reminder, I have put in the chat lots of different events by the week. Please, please do join us. Calligraphy on Tuesday, history with the House of Wisdom on Wednesday, and then what else have you got? Uh, Mecca and Medina with Prophet's Life on Thursday, and then a fabulous MacFest event in Berry. If you're in Berry in particular, it's all digital from one o'clock onwards. And then on Sunday, we have an international event with six artists, art, uh, filmmaker, artist, actress, um, I don't know, there's plenty of them from America down to Uzbekistan. And we'll give you more information, you know where to go. We are on MacFest website, you can join us from there. And of course, if you want to catch this event again, want to watch it, we are on Facebook live streaming and you can catch it again straight away. Or you can watch us again on our macros youtube channel so good evening everyone thank you so much again for joining us thank you everyone who's here in this portal at the moment and assalamu alaikum